The serene lands of the Far East tremble under the shadow of an approaching storm. A massive fleet advancing towards the shores of Japan darkens the sky dot. This is the Mongol Empire, a legendary power that brought half the world to its knees. Every nation they encountered was subdued by fire and sword. But this time, standing in their way are the legendary warriors known for their honor and unwavering loyalty unto death, the Samurai. The colossal Mongol army confronts the iron will of the Samurai. This is not merely a battle. It is a collision of two worlds, two warrior spirits. The Mongols were a relentless force that instilled fear into the hearts of emperors, keeping them in a state of constant dread. Living near them meant knowing that one day they might come for you, like a storm ready to unleash devastation. In those brutal times, failing to secure a favorable relationship with the Mongols was a death sentence, leading to a fate marked by unimaginable suffering. After the death of Munka Khan, Kublai Khan ascended to the throne and set his sights on Japan. In 1266, he expressed his dissatisfaction with Japan for not sending any envoys to the Mongol Empire and sent emissaries to the Japanese Emperor, demanding submission. In the letter sent with his emissaries, Kublai Khan referred to himself as the Great Mongol Emperor and addressed the Japanese Emperor as the Emperor of a small country. Kublai Khan demanded that the Emperor of Japan submit to him and pay tribute in exchange for their independence. However, not only did the Japanese give no response to this demand, but they also ignored the Mongol envoys and refused to even receive them at the court. Although this attitude angered the Mongols, Kublai Khan continued to send new envoys each year, yet none of his emissaries were ever received at the palace in Kyoto. It was becoming clear that the Japanese no longer wished to establish any kind of relationship, good or bad, with the Mongols. Kublai Khan saw this as a personal insult and began preparations for an invasion of Japan. Finally, the Mongols built 300 large and around 500 smaller ships in their shipyards in China and Korea and set out with an army of 40,000, which included both Korean and Chinese soldiers. In response, the Japanese were able to gather an army of approximately 10,000, mostly composed of samurai. When comparing these two great military forces, the samurai placed a high value on individual skills and honor in battle. While this made them master warriors, it sometimes put them at a disadvantage in collective and disciplined warfare strategies. Their tactics were generally focused on challenging the enemy and engaging in one-on-one -on -one combat. However, they were not as adept as the Mongols at developing unexpected and flexible strategies on the battlefield. They were more inclined to achieve results through individual heroism rather than coordinated movements. The Mongols, on the other hand, relied on a strategy based on well-organized armies rather than individual warriors. They would deceive and ambush their enemies by executing rapid tactical changes and employing tactics like feigned retreats. Their discipline and organizational skills made them more flexible and effective on the battlefield. Each unit took on specific tasks during different phases of the battle, ensuring excellent coordination throughout the army. The Mongols first landed on Tsushima Island and massacred the entire population. Immediately after, they set their sights on Hakata Bay, and the Mongol army began their invasion from this region. The Japanese were inexperienced, having never faced such large forces until that day. Samurais, who had mastered the art of one-on-one -on -one duels, found themselves unable to put up sufficient resistance when faced with such a massive army. After the first day of battle, just as the Japanese were on the verge of losing, a massive typhoon suddenly appeared. The Mongol ship captains, fearing that their vessels might be swept away or lost, and that the army would be stranded in Japan, decided to recall their forces from the battlefield. However, after the Mongol army was loaded onto the ships, the typhoon intensified even further. In just a few hours, nearly the entire Mongol fleet, along with its soldiers, was swallowed by the sea. Only a few Mongol ships managed to survive and were forced to return to Korea. Thus, the first Mongol invasion ended in failure. The resilient samurai, despite facing overwhelming odds, stood firm against the Mongol onslaught. Their unyielding spirit and tactical prowess showcased a fierce determination that refused to crumble. With every clash, the samurai's valor became legendary, embodying a nation's unwavering resolve to defend its homeland against a formidable and relentless foe. Kublai Khan, in an unexpected move, sent an envoy consisting of Buddhist monks. He also informed the monks that they would be executed if they returned without any response. However, the Japanese emperor still refused to receive this envoy. Due to their fear of Kublai Khan, the monks who could not return to Mongol territories were eventually sentenced to death by the Japanese emperor. The Japanese attitude, which could be seen as a declaration of war, led to swords being drawn once again, making the second Mongol invasion inevitable. After the initial attack, the Mongols were ready to launch a new assault with two powerful units. 
the first unit consisted of a fleet of 900 ships and 40,000 soldiers. The second unit, on the other hand, was made up of 3,500 ships and carried 100,000 soldiers. The battle plan involved a two-pronged attack. The first unit would strike from the north of the island, while the second unit would attack from the south. However, nothing went as planned. When the 40,000-strong advance force reached Hakata Bay, they struggled significantly to breach the two-meter-high wall. The samurai successfully repelled the Mongols with the help of walls and obstacles before the battle. Seeing the weakened Mongol army, the samurai did what they did best. They launched night raids on the ships and the Mongol camp to engage in one-on-one -on -one duels. They set many Mongol ships on fire and killed numerous Mongol soldiers. Thus, despite suffering heavy losses and being unable to advance for 50 days, the plans of the Mongol army changed. The second army of 100,000, expected to attack from the north, arrived to assist at Hakata Bay. Thousands of Mongol ships were ready on the sea to invade Japan. However, at that very moment, the second great miracle occurred. A massive typhoon struck Hakata Bay again. The storm was so powerful that out of 4,400 Mongol ships, only a few hundred managed to return. Along with the sunken ships, 90,000 Mongol soldiers lost their lives without ever engaging in battle. After this event, Kublai Khan, having lost over 100,000 soldiers and thousands of ships in two consecutive invasion attempts, believed that divine forces were protecting Japan and decided to abandon his plans for invasion. Thus, the Mongol advance, despite being numerically superior to the samurai and possessing greater technology and experience, was halted by the typhoons. After this heavy defeat, the Mongols avoided naval battles and continued their progress across the steppes. After the Mongol invasion of Japan, a new word that we all know today emerged, kamikaze. The Japanese viewed the typhoons that occurred during these two invasion attempts as a divine wind sent by the gods to save Japan. For this reason, they named these storms kamikaze, which means divine wind.